this is People in Power, and I'm Sama El Shahat. On today's program, state sponsored fear. If your president is uh, in danger, or if your president is your ex president, how could you think about your food in the supermarket? And Iran's own insurgents. نبر شیعه سه رحم میکنم و نبر سنی پس معلوم میشه که ایشون مدافی هیچ گروهی نیست جند الله یعنی سرباز خدا After a decades long war Eritrea's president Azias Afewerki led his country to independence from Ethiopia in 1991 but Afewerki remains convinced that Eritrea is still under threat of imminent invasion that Ethiopia harbors ambitions to try and retake the strategic Red Sea coast and if that happens, the rest of the world will not intervene. And as a result, the regime has kept the country on a permanent war footing, tolerating neither dissent nor opposition. Today, the president stands accused of isolating his country from the outside world and disappearing all who question his authority. Journalists are routinely imprisoned, and despite numerous promises, elections have never been held. It's very difficult to enter Eritrea on any kind of official basis. But journalist Sinead O'Shea and cameraman Scott Corbin traveled undercover to get this rare portrait of a country in the grip of a disturbing paranoia. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just landed in Asmara Airport. Eritrea, home to one of the most secretive regimes in the world. According to Reporters Without Borders, this is the most dangerous country in the world for journalists. Using the most basic recording equipment and disguised as tourists, we have set out to observe Eritrean life. These are to be the first independent images of Eritrea in eight years. On the surface, the capital Asmara is a pleasant place, with the more positive influences of Italy, its first colonizer, everywhere, from macchiatos to its Art Deco architecture. Muslims and Christians, each comprising almost 50% of the population, coexist peacefully. Tribal and religious unity are apparent. But we soon gain a sense of the other Eritrea, the one below the surface. Although we can't show you, we were constantly monitored. As a result, no one we did manage to speak to would do so on camera. We have also changed all their voices for their protection. We are not the only ones being watched. Communications are tightly controlled. Acquiring a mobile phone, for example, is no easy matter. In one phone shop, not the one shown here, we discover that everyone who wants a phone must go before a committee. Anyone can get it. Yeah, I can. You can or you can't? No, I can't. Oh, why not? Ben Rollins is a specialist on Eritrea with Human Rights Watch. We showed him our film when we returned to London. Eritrean society is under the complete control of the government. People cannot move from their houses or their workplaces without permission. Um, they can't even decide in most cases what job they do because people are conscripted from the age of 18 to 50. There are spies in schools, in the military, teachers spying on students, uh, students spying on teachers, young recruits spying on their commanders in the military. Um, neighbours spying on their neighbours, people within your family informing on you. Travel is difficult. At two dollars per litre, it is the second most expensive place in the world to buy petrol. But that's okay, because nobody's allowed to travel anywhere. The government-run tourist office tells us that there are just three roads we are allowed to take in the entire country. Even this map is an unusual sight within Eritrea. For security reasons, they're not readily available. We've been in Asmara two days now, and we finally have all the documents that we need to leave the city and see the rest of the country, or at least see the rest of the country that we're allowed to see. In the morning, we're going to go to Masawa and have a look at the Red Sea coastline and see what the Eritreans fought so hard to keep. After that, we're going to go towards the Ethiopian border. The flip side of Eritrea's isolation is that the country remains unspoiled.
It's okay? Soldiers. So put it down? Yes. Okay. Now we're at another security checkpoint and our driver has gone inside with our travel permits to show to the soldiers who are here. Say this is about the fourth checkpoint we've come through today over a distance of about 100 kilometers. After yet more checkpoints, we eventually come to the port of Misawa, a once crucial target during the war with Ethiopia, but little has been done to develop it since independence. In fact, the only real development in this area lies a few miles outside. These beach scenes are a very incongruous site in a country that is so obviously impoverished. But, according to a report by Human Rights Watch, it's far different out to sea. Here on the Red Sea coastline is where wealthy Eritreans come to play. But beyond the idyllic coastline lie the Dalek Islands. This is where Eritrea's biggest prison is located, which is where some of the worst human rights abuses are taking place. There is a massive clandestine network of prisons across Eritrea. One of the problems for human rights organisations is actually understanding where all those sites are and how many people are being held. In all of those places, we're hearing accounts of torture, systematic extreme torture. Although those who have fled the country have spoken out about these abuses, the atmosphere of intense watchfulness make it extremely difficult for Eritrean people to discuss this. Those we spoke to were very frightened and took a considerable risk in doing so. Once again, none of them could talk to us on camera. <laughs> Do you know anybody who got in trouble? Of course, very many. Nobody is officially allowed to leave Eritrea. There is a shoot to kill policy at the border. Despite this, the country is one of the largest creators of refugees in the world, with thousands fleeing through the tough landscape every year. Eritrea is the youngest country in Africa and was once considered the continent's brightest hope, implementing democratic reforms and promoting an atmosphere of openness to the rest of the world. So what happened? It's all about history. After World War II and the collapse of Italy's empire, Ethiopia set its sights on reclaiming Eritrea and, crucially, its strategic Red Sea coastline. For most of the next five decades, Eritrea resisted in spectacular fashion. Although they did receive some aid from the Russians, they fought most of this war on their own. By any standards, their victory, led by Aseis Afewerki, now the president, and a vastly outnumbered army of men and women, was an extraordinary achievement. I think the relationship between Ethiopia and Eritrea is key to the current political situation because that is the justification that the regime of Isaiah Sofwerki uses for its continued repression and its continued militarization. The ferocity of the fighting is still visible today. Independence was finally gained in 1993, but the peace was short-lived. According to Eritreans, in 1998, the Ethiopians attempted to re-seize the border town of Badmi. Three more years of bloodshed followed, resulting in the deaths of 150,000 Eritreans. Once again, the international community was perceived to have done nothing to help. Since then, the country has been in a state of high alert, and the reformist structures which seemed so promising a decade ago have been abandoned. Conscription is compulsory until the age of 50. The militarization is highly visible, even during our limited journey, which eventually took us back into the interior and south. We are in Sanafi, which is about 25 kilometers from the Ethiopian border, and this is as far as we can go. All around us, we can see the devastation that Eritreans experienced. We have to be very careful as we speak because there's a lot of people watching us here. There's a lot of soldiers around the place. Ethiopia is an important Western ally in the Horn of Africa. Due to the current crisis in Somalia, this is an especially troubled part of the world. Eritreans all share an absolute belief that if Ethiopia were to reinvade, 
just as before, they would be ignored, as a well-placed official and government supporter told us. Do you really think Ethiopia is about to invade you? You could come in. We have paid a price, Shabla. We have paid. I myself have paid my own price. And I don't want it to happen again to me because my children will lose their own father. And so all of Eritrea's money and energy is devoted to the military, whose feats are celebrated every night on TV. <laughs> Meanwhile, people queue for food and beg on the streets. It all keeps coming back to that emphasis on security. <laughs> Uh, in danger, or if your presence, if your existence is already under question mark, how do you think about having food in the supermarket? We met many people who loved their country and wanted change, but this cannot be stated aloud. Thousands of people, including the president's former comrades and political colleagues, have disappeared for trying to do so. You are not an Eritrean if you critique Eritrea. You are a member of the elite, and your motives aren't pure. You consider it yourself as an elite, do you want house to gain more land, more property, more house, luxurious property, which you have appropriated to a previous government. It all that you have is to defend, to flourishing the government. It may not be an option for Eritrean people to question their government, but while we are in Eritrea, Hillary Clinton decided to do so. She declared that the US will take action unless Eritrea stops supporting terrorism in Somalia. In a carefully choreographed interview, President Afewerki succinctly refuted the charge. There is no terrorism in Somalia. There is a legitimate resistance of the Somali people against local warlords and against external uh, intervention. If that is terrorism, then let it be. In their way, Clinton's remarks will come as a help to the regime further fueling that sense of persecution and victimhood that can be used to justify everything. As we prepare to smuggle our tapes out of the country, we meet with a former child soldier. She now questions the sacrifices she has made. The main thing is uh, our life didn't change. This is a uh, constant. All the she now lives on about $30 a month and shares a toilet with 20 families. Like so many others, she is desperate to leave and will soon risk everything to do so. And the it is a better life. I want to live. The regime at the moment is very firmly entrenched, um, but tens of thousands of, pe of people are leaving every month. So uh, Eritrea is, you know, progressively weakened by the exodus of its population. It's got serious exchange rate problems. It's got, you know, spreading famine. Um, so no regime can continue uh, an illegitimate grip on power indefinitely. The Eritrean government say they are just defending themselves. The irony is that they may be left with nothing to defend. Sinead Osheva in the country known to many as Africa's North Korea. And now we turn to Iran, which is often accused of supporting insurgents throughout the Middle East. Well, a bloody attack in October against members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard has reminded the world that Iran has its own insurgency problems. A Sunni Muslim group known as Jundullah has claimed responsibility for that attack and many others saying that the Sunni inhabitants of the Iranian province of Sistan and Baluchistan are being oppressed by the Shia majority. Tehran defends its heavy hand in the region on the basis that it's combating drug smugglers and a new breed of Sunni fighters supported by the West who have brought suicide bombing onto Iranian soil. Nazanin Moshiri reports. <laughs> Iran's elite revolutionary guards are not used to losing their own. They went into deep mourning after 15 were killed by a suicide bomber in the remote province of Sistan, Baluchistan. The revolutionary guards were established to protect the Islamic Republic's revolutionary ideals and are now one of the most powerful institutions in the country. 
This is the worst attack they've endured since the Iran-Iraq war more than 20 years ago. The scene of the suicide bombing in Sistan, Baluchistan, left untouched as a memorial to the victims. The bomber struck when senior revolutionary guards were meeting local Baluchi tribesmen. The effect was devastating. More than 20 of the victims were local Sunnis. Gamshad Zanama's son Omran died that day. He now wants revenge. <laughs> The attack happened in Pishin, a town on Iran's border with Pakistan, in the southeast corner of the country. The Sunni Muslim inhabitants here say they're discriminated against, that their region is neglected. They may have their own mosques and Sunni schools, but there are no jobs. Many turn to drug trafficking just to make a living. And as the October bombing showed, others are resorting to direct attacks against the Tehran government. Suicide bombings happen in neighboring countries like Afghanistan, Iraq and Pakistan, not here in Iran. Many experts think that this new threat shows that this ethnic conflict has now become a sectarian one. I think previously Jundallah had a localized agenda. Now it's broadened that out to a national scale. We saw the October attack against the Revolutionary Guard, which was much more brazen and much more audacious. And that shows a change in tactics, a uh, change in strategy. Uh, they've become more confident and have the confidence to strike uh, the Revolutionary Guard at a time when it feels more vulnerable. This is the man responsible for the increasing violence, Abdul Malik Rigi. His group of fighters go by the name of John Dullah, or Soldiers of God. His aims, he says, are Sunni rights. His ideology close to the Taliban. Although now based in neighboring Pakistan, he is one of the most feared men in Iran. Tribal leaders admit there are serious problems, but they want to be left to deal with them on their own terms. Golnami Barawai has researched Jundullah and its leader for years. He's had death threats because of his investigations. He says Rigi's methods are not legitimate. گروه چند دلار گروهی که قبلا به گفته برادرش عبدالحمید با گروه طالبان بالاخره هم کاری داشته و رابطه طالبان بین افغانستان و کشور عربی بوده نه بر شیعه رحم میکنه و نه بر سنی پس معلوم میشه که چون مدافع هیچ گروهی نیست چند دلار یعنی سرباز خدا نمیشه بهشون گفت بی این گروه گفت گروه چند دلار تو سرباز خدا نیستن کاری که خدا خواسته در قرآن بالاخره بارا اعلام کرده but Jundullah must have a support base amongst some of the region's Sunni population. It can't operate without local help. The problem for the Iranian authorities, how to deal with this homegrown threat. What happened here was a hit at the very heart of the Revolutionary Guards. Tehran has been forced to act. One approach is to fight back hard in the mountains behind me. Tehran says that Abdul Malik Rigi and hundreds of his fighters are hiding across these mountains in Pakistan. The Pakistani government handed over Abdel Hamid Rigi, the brother of the Jundullah leader, in 2008. He's in Iranian custody facing execution. He admits he has killed for Jundullah and has made numerous TV confessions in which he claims to have backing from the United States. سال 83 گفت جنرال هم آمریکایی اومده بود که عبد المالک با اون صحبت کرد تو اسلام آباد که این صحبت ها بود که بلان است که شما بیرون بلوچستان میتونید عملیات انجام بدید تو تهران تو شهرهای بزرگ ایران 
که به مال گفته بود که اگر امکانات شما بدید پول امکانات بدید ما هر جای ایران میتونیم عملیات انجام بدیم مشکل نداره He says the Americans gave him $100,000, but he couldn't name the general and was vague on dates and times. But it's an allegation Iran's Revolutionary Guards agree with. Its loyalty lies with the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. خاکون کشف شده محل آموزش تروریست ها توسط سرویس های امنیتی آمریکا انگلیس اسرائیل اصلا خود خاکی کشف شده محمد اینها محل آموزش محل تجهیز خب اگر واقعا ما الان این رو به وزارت امور خارجه عرض کردیم که با کشورهای همسایه ما با مذاکره صحبت کنند واقعا ما تعاملمون محدود هستش این چی All of these countries have categorically denied any involvement However in July 2008 investigative journalist Seymour Hersh revealed in a report that US congressional leaders had secretly agreed to a funding request from President George Bush for $400 million to arm and fund groups like John Dulla. But experts believe this isn't the policy of the Obama administration. I think these accusations are long-standing and they've been revived by the Iranian authorities um, on the back of broader allegations of a Western ploy to disturb and destabilize Iran's security. Uh, we can see on, this is um, against the backdrop of, of a broader effort by uh, the Iranian authorities to discredit opposition groups in the country as well. It's unlikely that the Obama administration has any direct links to Jundallah. I think that strategy has, has shown to have backfired in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So it's hard to see that link. Whoever is or isn't backing Abdul Malik Rigi and his group of fighters, they're able to move freely across this mountainous border. The Iranians' biggest fear, they will strike again. Now, a fortnight ago, we reported from Ireland on an appalling story of child sex abuse involving Roman Catholic religious orders over several decades. Because I still be getting up at night, jumping out of the bed, sweat bubbling out through me, because I see these fellas at the end of the bed. In that story, we also mention an investigation into child abuse by Catholic priests from Dublin and fears that an official report on the scandal might be suppressed. Well, last week, that report was finally released, revealing that abuse had been both widespread and systematically covered up by church authorities. Ireland's senior Catholic clerics have since apologized publicly for the scandal, but the Vatican receives criticism in the report for not replying to any requests for information. That's it for this edition of People in Power. If you'd like to comment on today's films, we'd love to hear from you on aljazeera.net forward slash English. Until next time, bye-bye.